Good evening to you all. Can you hear me? Good. Um, if my voice drops away, just sort of make funny faces at me or wave your arms madly in the air and I'll speak up again. Um, and that's great. So as I, as, it's lovely to have people here visiting from other churches. I've said hello to some of you and it's wonderful you should come along. We do these cultural Fridays, I think every third Friday of the month. And we're trying to look at the way in which our faith, which we so often express on a Sunday in church together, actually is involved in everything that we do every day. And we thought it would be nice to look at some of the hymns because sometimes we get reminded of what, where we disagree, but uh, there's enough disagreeable things in the world and it would be good to see where we agree. And often it's in the hymns that we sing we'll find we would not perhaps recognise which congregation we're in because the hymns have a familiarity across all of our different congregations and denominations. So uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. And all I'm going to do is take us on a brief journey through some hymns for the brave and the bold amongst you. We shall be singing at certain points. So lift up those voices with praise. I'm always encouraged, as I remind my wife regularly, it only says in the Bible that we're to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. <laughs> Tunefulness, who cares? So as long as you can make a joyful noise, you shall be free and happy with us. So yes, let's have the next slide up. So why do we sing hymns and where is music? Well, one of the things that holds the whole of scripture together and our journey as followers of Jesus is the Psalms, which is often called the songbook of the Bible. Um, these were chanted and uh, there's these, this whole group of Psalms called the Song of Ascents, which was as the Israelites made their way to Jerusalem, which was going uphill, they would sing. Uh, we don't quite know how, whether they were chants or uh, rhythms of some sort or another, but they would present these psalms, which we have copies of. And psalm oil, it just says there, instrumental music or by extension words accompanying the music. So singing is right at the heart of the worship of God from the earliest of times, a collection of 150 poems. I won't go over everything that's all up there. This character who's in the picture, anybody like to hazard a guess at who that is? Yes, sir. King, King David. King David it is, yes, who's well known for calming uh, King Saul with uh, the playing of the musical instruments and uh, wrote a large number of the psalms that we have just been mentioning about. And so all the psalms are addressed to God, and this will become a point <coughs> that we make as we go through, that uh, the focus in all of these, and the focus is God right at the centre. That will become apparent why I say that a little bit further on. So singing in scripture, there we are, tweeting our way, lift up your voices to God. The earliest Christians put their community beliefs into songs. That's how they kind of communicated. And if you look through the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, you will find that there are songs that capture the victories and celebrate certain moments in uh, the history of the Jewish people as they develop their understanding of God. And then congregational singing as we know it, as we participate it, uh, participate it came in at the time of the Reformation. But the earliest, the most, uh, many uh, theologians think that the earliest indication we have of a song or a hymn after the life and ministry of Jesus are these words that Paul puts into Philippians. It begins the italics there in your relationships with another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then these words are thought to be an early hymn that they would have sung. Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we have this sense of Christians, early Christians gathering and taking some of their understanding and putting it in song. And it's theological. It's not just a song for the sake of it, as we might listen to 
on uh, our, our computers, our iTunes, or whatever else we're listening to. It's a song that seeks to capture some of our understandings about who God is. Now, what do you think the benefit of putting some of those uh, thoughts into a song are? Why, would that, why is that helpful if some of the things that we believe to be true are in a song? Anybody like to hazard a guess? Just so we remember. It's easier to remember. Easy to remember. That's right. Were you going to say something else? It's prayerful. Pardon? Prayerful. prayerful. Okay, singing is again prayerful. But it is that we remember songs. I'm Jane's here. Uh, Jane is known as the queen of the one-liner. <laughs> she knows the first line of just about every pop song that ever is, but it fades away after the first line. Sadly, uh, the substance of the rest of the song is not there. So we call her the queen of the one-liner in our family. But when we get the words of a song within our heart, we, it seems easier to somehow recall it and remind ourselves. And I'm sure, like me, many of us in difficult circumstances have found a familiar or favourite him come to mind and perhaps the words have proved comforting um, people in difficult situations that we visit sometimes when they're ill when they're facing that sort of challenge they like to have a familiar song playing it calms it brings us to a place of focus in our faith and uh, it seems that was born right at the very heart or right at the start of the Christian journey now I have to use Ephraim the Syrian, who's from the fourth century, as you can see, because there's a huge amount of poetry, which is the, the framework for hymns. Oh yeah, sorry, keep going. Sorry, I should be saying, shouldn't okay. I? Keep going, keep going. Uh, that's it, that's the one. <laughs> sorry, I need to give instructions, I forget. Yes. Um, <laughs> so why I say Ephraim the Syrian, my back, my, a lot of my studies in the past have been with the, the Syriac church, so I did my doctorate in. For those who wonder, I'm sure it's going to actually interest nobody. But the wonderful thing is finding some of these characters, and they write these most beautiful poems. Light of the just and joy of the upright is Christ Jesus our Lord. Begotten of the Father, he manifested himself to us. He came to rescue us from darkness and to fill us with radiance of his light. Day is dawning upon us. The power of darkness is fading away. The poem goes on, I only put a small portion on. And some of these, it would seem, again, were taken into uh, hymns, were sung. Um, if you go to the Iranian church, you will find poetry is the primary form of their liturgical worship. They love poetry. I understand not a word of it, I've listened to it, but it's got a lilt and a character and a sense, a movement around it. And so, again, we've got these ideas of poems of words, words that come together well, words that build a picture. And uh, there we are, a new hymn, a new songwriter among us. But uh, so they, they come together and they give a real sense and a picture, an image of God. And I talked earlier on about the focus being on God, because I then want to move right up, well, relatively up to date compared to ancient times. We're actually going to go into uh, the early 1700s. But the reality of what happens is that there's a change in our understanding of how hymns are communicated. Let's change the slide. Look at that, perfect poetry. Um, Isaac Watts, anybody got an idea why I would settle on Isaac Watts? Because he was born locally within Winchester. Southampton? Yeah. Yeah, and you've got Isaac Watts Park down in Southampton. So I don't think he ever played for the Saints, but uh, he did have a trial, I believe. But the reality is Isaac Watts is a hymn writer. He's an English congregational minister, hymn writer, theologian and logician. He's the sort of person you would hate. He was learning Latin by the age of four, Greek at nine, French, which he took up just to converse with his refugee neighbours at 11, and Hebrew at 13. The sort of person you really want in your class, don't you? But there we are. We all had them. Yes, we all had them. Yes, please. <laughs> oh, you're a teacher. Fellow of the Royal Schools of Music. Fellow of the Winchester Music School. Oh, there we are. I better watch what I say, sir. It's good to have you with us. But so, Isaac Watts. Yes, so he was like that. He, he wrote, he's not just a hymn writer, because again, these guys are incredible. He wrote 30 theological treatises, essays on psychology, astronomy, and philosophy. Volumes of the first children's hymnal, interestingly enough. So he obviously had a heart for children. I guess 
he, he, you know, learning all these things when he was young, maybe he thought that was something that was missing. But what we see with Isaac Watts is he moved from the metrical psalms to personal reflection. And a note of subjective religious experience is, is introduced, by which I mean, whereas before I said that God was right at the centre, so it was always looking outward, upward, whatever language we use, Isaac Watts then began to think about what about the person who is responding to God. His most famous, or one of his most famous hymns is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And he puts the I, the pronoun, right in. Whereas before when we're looking at hymns, we're looking at the description in those earlier ones of the nature and character of God, what Isaac Watts does is to turn around and say, what impact does that on me? How do I respond? What do I perceive? What is the personal response? in that particular journey. And uh, based it on scripture, Galatians 6.14, written in 1707 as a communion hymn. And to see, he said this, which is a bit bold, isn't it? Because it's a bit critical. He said, to see the dull indifference, the negligent and thoughtless air that sits upon the faces of a whole assembly, by which he means a congregation, while the psalm is upon their lips, might even tempt a charitable observer to suspect the fervency of their inward religion. <laughs> So I see some dog collars here that will understand precisely what Isaac Watts was getting at as you look out upon your congregation, I'm sure. But his whole response was to see how do we enliven faith? And again, committed to the hymns, he saw that music wakens up the soul, plays into our hearts, awakens and stirs us. And I think we often find that. We know certain hymns affect us emotionally in different ways. And what Isaac Watts tried to do was to move to catch that emotion. What's my response? How should I be responding to these words that I am singing and that are before me? And um, we're not going to sing this one, but I put the words of when I survey the wondrous cross, just to illustrate <laughs> it. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast. I keep going through, but you get the I, the response of how is it that I am feeling? It's not just a large declaration about the authority, the beauty, the grace, the kindness, the justice of God. It's about my own personal emotional response. And so we have this dynamic then coming into our hymns. We're asked to reflect upon how am I responding to the God that I'm worshipping? And then music is added to that because one side you've got the lyricist, the hymn writer, the, the one who writes the lyrics, then of course there's the music. And we'll hear later on about how pairing the music with the words is quite an art form. And often if you look in your hymnals, you'll see the writer of the hymn, the lyricist, and the music. And certain ones, we know, certain hymns, they have different tunes that they can be sung to and it quite changes the sense we get of the hymn at times with a different tune that's used so we realize that actually we're caught up entirely it's not just a a head a thought process of worshiping god we're invited to allow our emotions to come into play in our response to god this is a total connection and the hymns are there to help to do that. We used to talk about, in my early days, uh, um, people used to talk about a hymn prayer sandwich as though the hymn was the kind of, you know, just sort of, oh, well, that'll help us do this. And sometimes we can still think like that. Oh, yes, it's the hymn. That's when they're going to take up the offering or whatever it may going to be. We lose sight of the fact that it's part of the total worship. There may be other movement. There may be other things taking place. But it's not a moment for us to say, good, I think I'll just take out my phone and look at what's going on uh, with my Facebook page. It's actually all part of the total worship that we're about. And maybe there's a little bit of time for us at that point individually to pause, maybe to reflect upon where we've come from, the readings, presentations, things that we've heard, or prepare our hearts for where we're heading to next, to prepare our hearts to move towards communion, Eucharist, uh, in our congregational gathering. So the music is to try to capture and bring all of us 
into that sense of worship of God and never miss an opportunity just to, why is that going on? Use it to reflect where I've come from, prepare my heart for where I'm going to. And sometimes that's what we can do with the words. The words themselves are chosen, whoever's leading the music. It's not just we think, what hymns shall we have this week? The people in charge of uh, the, the, the music in our congregations are uh, hopefully thinking about the journey that we're on and how is it going to add a sense of enabling to us to move through uh, the particular service we're in. But that's what I think. Isaac Watts, local Southampton, but this idea of bringing the eye right back into the heart of worship. It's, it's yes, it's looking out to the vastness of God, but it's also how am I responding and engaging with the God that I'm worshiping. Changing slide here. I've only put this on because we're gonna move on to um, John Newton. And I love this picture. So the only reason it's in this slideshow is because I like it so much. <laughs> it's, it's a Rembrandt of Jesus in the boat, but it is one of my very favorite pictures. And it does fit to a degree because we're moving now from uh, Southampton and Isaac Watts to John Newton, who himself was a sailor. John Newton wrote this about himself. He said, I am not the man I ought to be. I am not the man I wish to be. And I am not the man I hope to be, but by the grace of God, I am not the man I used to be. And I guess many of us can feel like that. And I, and I want to encourage us because often when we hear things and we're journeying on our own journeys with God, we can often, we often apply that word ought and should, don't we, to ourselves. I ought to pray more. I should do, I should help more people. We beat ourselves up a bit. But I think God's grace and love is such that I love this quote. All of those things may well be true, but we can never get beyond the wonderful grace of God and remind ourselves that we are not the person we used to be. And that is a great encouragement. And I often think that when I'm, well here, I come to mass here on a Sunday, and I often sit there, what do we do? We obviously see everybody will have their own prayer before they um, before the service begins but that's sometimes what I want to give thanks for I know there's a lot of things that uh, may not be quite perfect in my life as far as I'm concerned but I give thanks to God that I can be here because I'm not who I used to be by the grace of God and tomorrow I hopefully will have moved still further so John Newton now he had a reason for saying that because he had quite a remarkable and difficult life. His mother died when he was seven. He was sent to sea at the age of nine. Imagine what a, some of our kids would be like at the age of nine, trying to go off to sea, look after themselves. On his own description, my early life was godless and dissolute, but uh, out of the raw material of all of our lives, God can make something really beautiful if we allow that to happen. He was flogged for deserting the Navy. And at 22, 22, all of that had happened before he was 22. He was captaining a slave ship and he got involved into slaving, but he got hold of a book by Thomas Akempis, The Imitation of Christ. And uh, I can't imagine there's a huge amount to do on a ship if everything's going well. So you're reading this one book, The Imitation of Christ. And then he got caught up a little later in a violent nine hour storm where he despaired of life itself. And all of this caused him to really reconsider whether he had got life worked out. And those words of Thomas a Kempis, and like many of us, I think, we are in our congregational life, and this is where there's a unity between all of us, we're all seeking to discover something more of the divine. It eludes our words, but it stirs our hearts, and it empowers our journey to go in search. And of course, every time we pause to criticize somebody else, we're misusing our time, time that could be used to be exploring more of who we are and who God is. So he comes to this conversion, he leaves the Navy, he meets with John Wesley and George Whitfield, John Wesley, who eventually, uh, oh, with his brother Charles, founded the Methodist Church, and George Whitfield, the great preacher, that 
was one of the uh, a major evangelical awakening within the British Isles. Wesley's particularly working with working class people and uh, he was directed towards what was then to get into the Anglican Church and nine years ordination training. We've got some Anglicans here, not quite nine years was it? No. <laughs> Glad you weren't training in the uh, uh, 18th century. But nine years ordination training and then he went to Olney which is a little village in Buckinghamshire. The little church is still there, it's a beautiful place to go. If you'd like to go on a pilgrimage any time, go to John Newton's church in Olney, where he was there from 1764, quite a number of years. In his congregation, as luck would have it, he had the great poet William Cooper, and together they worked on hymns. Now before we said that hymns, they help us remember things. June was telling us that we carry a hymn in our heart, it helps us to remember. John Newton worked that out. And so John Newton knew he was going to stand up and preach on a Sunday. He also knew that if the congregation remembered more than a sentence by the time they left the church, he was doing well. <laughs> so he wrote with William Cooper the words of his homily or sermon into hymns. And he taught the hymn to the congregation. So that when the congregation left, they would spend the week, hopefully, strolling to work and back, singing the hymn and reminding themselves of the message that he wanted them to understand. Bit sneaky maybe, but that's the way that he did it. And uh, he was consistently, this hymn is about a celebration of God's grace and his own wretchedness. Um, if we change the slide there. Um, and then he began to reflect upon his past life and the slave ships that he had run and uh, the slave trade that with, with which he had been engaged and no doubt he would have been amongst those if slaves fell ill upon a slave ship they were just slung overboard because their value was no longer uh, giving them a berth not that they had a berth they were just packed in and uh, as he reflected upon it he wrote these words it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. And I think he gives us a wonderful picture here, and hymns can do this to us, and looking at the stories behind them. He was a man who had a history like we each have a history, but he discovered he did not have to be a prisoner of his history. He could actually move forward from that history and make some amendment of life, which he did in getting involved in the slave trade with William Wilberforce, uh, the parliamentarian, part of the Clapham sect, and for 20 years they struggled to end slavery. In 1807 a law was passed that ended the trade of enslaved people in the British West Indies, and in that year John Newton died. It's almost as though he had contributed his peace, that went through, he went to his eternal rest. And uh, when Wilberforce was a child, Newton was actually his pastor and later his mentor. And again, I think we see a, a great role here within the church, which many people don't understand uh, in our secular society. There's a great opportunity here for this idea, not to impose ourselves as mentors, but there's more people watching and observing how we choose to live, think, and do things, which is, uh, it's interesting, the influence that perhaps we can often have without realizing it. And it's better that we don't realize it because you're probably real Christians, but for me I just get proud and think, oh good old me, the world's a better place because of that. So, and then a later law in 1833, which was the year Wilberforce died, was passed, which, which was the Slavery Abolition Act, freed, which freed over 800,000 enslaved people uh, throughout the British territories. So then we come, if we change the slide, we're going to come to Amazing Grace, we'll sing this in a minute, but it's an amazing thing because sometimes we think about amazing grace it's got this capturing idea it starts with amazing grace grace that gift of God to us all that saved a wretch like me now when we sing that we have to go back really to the original meaning of wretch because it sounds a bit sort of putting ourselves down oh what a wretch am I and uh, it's almost like a bit sort of overkill on how we describe ourselves but the word wretch comes from the word wrecker which actually means exile in Old English. 
and what he's saying that saved an exile like me, that I was outside of God's grace and I've now, by God's grace, been brought into God's grace, however that journey takes place. So he's actually <coughs> talking about his absolute dependence upon God's grace to become the person that he wanted to be. Once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. We know the words. The last verse that's down there when we've been there 10,000 years, he didn't write that. It was added by some helpful person later, um, but that's not part of the original hymn, although we sing it as, as part of that. But that's the, the heartbeat. And I think this is perhaps more than anything else, the autobiographical hymn of John Newton, because it captures his sense of coming from a place of desperation to a place of acceptance. Remember his mother died when he was seven in the Navy at nine, a place of looking for love and affirmation to finding love and affirmation uh, in that sign. So the words are up there. As I said, if you don't sing, you're in trouble because I'm terrible. <laughs> and um, so if we'd like to sing, would it be good to sing? Do you fancy a sing? Yeah, come on. So we will sing along to the, to the tune as it comes on. Let's go for it. Well, that was a bit of fun, wasn't it? 
<laughs> I love it. But it's great. I was once in um, working many years ago. I went to South Africa. <coughs> And uh, I was working in the, in the black townships in the bad old days and uh, working with a group of Christians there in Mokhlakeng, which is a township just outside uh, Joburg. And uh, I went along into this little hut and uh, it was for, for a Sunday service. There weren't any instruments there. There wasn't anything much there. Just a group of people and I had a translator whispering in my ear. And the person leading the service and he, he just said to this little group of us gathered there, um, uh, turned to one of the girls, I can't remember her name, let's call her Grace. Grace, would you begin us with a song of worship. Of course, it's being translated to me. She says, oh, Pastor, I, I can't today because there's a deep sadness in my heart which I will share later. But then someone else said, but I can start with a song of praise. And they did. So she wasn't saying I won't sing, but it was the most wonderful service as we just sort of sung with no instruments, with voices, um, me la la lying along because I didn't know the language. But uh, just that whole piece of going on of what music can do to create a space and the great freedom there is uh, to be ourselves. And we'll all have taken something different from those words, which is wonderful. So moving on as we are next slide, I want to put that Augustine of Hippo quote there because it comes right at the after of what we've been saying about John Newton. For grace is given not because we have done good works, but in order that we may be able to do them. It's always that lovely future focus that we come into these situations. And in sadness, we can play uh, sometimes the music. And as I say, our emotions are engaged. Moving on to the next slide, if we may. Henry Francis Light was born in Kelso, graduated from Trinity College. You can see those things there. Again, his father abandoned the family. And it was only the local headmaster who recognized his talent, who paid for his education and for his fees. And uh, they, again, choose them, a little bit local to us in the New Forest. They lived in Sway, Hampshire. And uh, here he and his wife uh, lost a month old daughter and he wrote his first book. You know, in going through life, one of the things that uh, we need to record is that life is never easy for any one of us. It, no, ma no matter who we are or where we come from, everybody has a story of challenge and difficulty in their life. And that's one of the things that brings us together. That's one of the factors of our unity. That's one of the reasons why we walk with one another. We're not, again, just remembering and being aware. Yes, I may have some troubles in my life, but if I've got some troubles, I know everybody is facing a difficulty at some time in some way. It's a great measure of perhaps awakening our compassion towards one another. And in 1823, he moved to Devon and uh, became a perpetual curate in the parish of Lower Brixham. Change slide. Uh, he was the one who we give uh, credit for for writing Abide With Me in 1820. He visited a dying friend. As a young man, he visited a dying friend who encouraged him with the words, Abide With Me. They stuck with him. We don't know quite the context, whether this guy was as he approached his own death, was thinking of those words from John 15, abide in me and I will abide in you. But he left this strong impression of these three words upon Francis Light, abide with me. And the whole hymn is based upon the Emmaus Road account in Luke 24, where Jesus made to go on, but they invited him to stay because the night was coming on. Um, it was given a new tune. We often find, as I said, different tunes go with different ones. And uh, it was given a, a new tune for which it's remembered, which I think given it, has given its great place, certainly in English understanding and identity, um, by William Monk. And I love this little piece because I put it in. Monk's widow described the context which gave her husband inspiration for the tune Eventide, which is the familiar tune that uh, it is sung to. And uh, she said this, hand in hand, we were silently watching the glory of the setting sun, our daily habit, until the golden hue had faded. Then he took paper and penciled the tune, which has gone all over the world. I think it's a wonderful touch that we see the humanity, what lies behind a lot of these hymns. They get put into collections, they get put in hymn books. We're familiar with the covers. We turn up at church to sing, but behind the lyrics, and behind every hymn is a human story, maybe of challenge and difficulty as we're aware. 
And so we look at the word slightly differently. This is someone trying to convey that despite challenge and difficulty, yet I'm holding on to God in some way or another. Changing slide here. Abide With Me has had quite an amazing history. I'll start on the right-hand side. It's sung at every single FA Cup final. Some of the most, who would describe themselves, I'm sure, as the most non-religious people, emotionally singing a stirring song before the FA Cup. It's actually sung at the uh, Rugby League Challenge Cup final as well. And uh, it was introduced, it replaced Alexander's Ragtime Band. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, God won, <laughs> sectorism nil. Um, and the initiative was firmly supported by the King and the Queen. And it, it's grown and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sung with, um, and there's a measure of, with all the sort of hullabaloo that goes on the FA Cup final, I haven't watched one for a few years on TV, but it always used to be, it's, it's taken quite seriously. Uh, it pulls people together. And there's another dynamic of our, our sense of unity and our hymn singing. The singing brings, as it just did then, it brings us together. There's a sense of, you know, I, when I was growing up, we used to do community singing a little bit more. I was, I've been married twice. My first wife, unfortunately, died from um, a progressive multiple sclerosis quite some years ago. But she was Scottish. She was from the Isle of Skye. And we had to go to Scotland. Little did I know what I was marrying into. <laughs> but whenever you go to Scotland and there's a party, you have to do a turn. <laughs> it can be any sort of turn, but they do like a bit of singing. Um, and uh, what I did find, and this, you know, if you're Scottish, this could sound a very anti-Scottish statement. What I, I did find difficult was an awful lot of the Scottish folk songs are quite depressing. It was a bright sunny morning, we set out on the boat, the storm came up, the spokes sank, we drowned, the, 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 the mothers were left at home with 63 babies, nothing to feed them, you were It wasn't exactly elevating, so I used to do, anybody remember Flanders and Swan? Yeah. Yes. I used to do the gas man cover to try and lighten the mood, just a little bit, but they thought that Sasanaki he doesn't understand anything. So, but it kind of brings us together doesn't it? This sort of singing of songs in that way. So we sit in the FA Cup final. But Edith Cavill, anybody know the story of Edith Cavill? The nurse. Yeah, she was. She was in Belgium in 1915. In the, Well, she was in Belgium before 1915, but she was caught up in the early stage of the First World War. And she ran a little hospital and she insisted on treating all wounded servicemen as they came in, be they allies, as we would say from a British point of view, or allies, as a German would say, standing on the German side. But uh, she treated them all equally and looked after them. But when the Germans overran the place, she was arrested. And uh, even though she explained to the firing squad, singing, abide with me. So it touches into Someone in those moments, who knows, you know, someone said to me, you never know whether you're courageous until you have to find courage. Um, it's already to describe ourselves as courageous, but we'll never know till we're asked to face something courageously. But courageously, she found courage in going back to something familiar and drawing upon those words and singing those words accompanied by the chaplain before she had to make that solo journey out to stand in front of the firing squad. So it's, I think it's a song that's very deeply embedded into our psyche uh, as an English nation for a variety of those sort of reasons. And it captures, again, uh, a, a, a note of where we are. So if we turn on a, on a slide, we come to it, we will sing it. And, you know, it's that sense. I say it comes from the road of Emmaus, abide with me, fast falls the even tide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. So it's got that picture of Emmaus Road, of them having just, you know, even at that stage, they're asking the Lord to stay with them, though as we know it's only in the breaking of the bread at that meal in the house that they recognise this is the risen Christ that they had been so sorrowful walking on their journey from Jerusalem as having lost. So again, it's a, it's a great, great song to sing. Do we fancy singing this one? Yeah. Are we up for it? If you want to stand, you can stand. Is it easier to stand to sing, or do you like sitting down? I don't mind. Sitting down? Good. Well, then, that's it. We'll stay sitting then, and we'll try to follow on the music as best we can. Okay, let's go for this one. 